They say there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who find themselves and those who create themselves. Are you looking for purpose or deciding it for yourself? Will you plunge waiting for someone to catch you? Or will you jump and build your wings on the way down? Seek a path or carve a path. Wait for the future or build it. What is a school but a set of walls waiting for greatness? And who are you but someone destined to achieve it? Here, between the street and the jungle, against time and tide, we push and pull just like the currents. Our ocean of dreams will meet the odds ahead and rise above it all. The College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences offers a variety of programs where students can expand their knowledge and capabilities. We help broaden your horizons by experiencing and discovering different cultures from around the world by taking you to places such as Bali, various islands in Micronesia, Japan, China, Europe, New Zealand, and Korea to participate in different opportunities such as research conferences, internships, and competitions. We give you the tools necessary to succeed after college, turning challenges into opportunities. A lot of opportunities have opened up for me that I'm very grateful for. I've had freelance writing positions, taught poetry workshops. I was even able to travel with an organization with class where I presented a paper on a topic I was very interested in. By majoring in anthropology, communication, Chamorro studies, English, fine arts, history, philosophy, political science, psychology, and sociology, you will meet others who share the same passion and build connections that will last. In class, you'll always have um, a support system. No matter where you go, during college or after college, someone will always be there for you. The knowledge that you gain throughout the courses can be applied to anything. It doesn't matter if it's career choice, it can also just be in life. College of Liberal Arts helps you find your moments of transformation from ordinary to extraordinary. The best advice I could give you as a student from UOG is to keep an open mind and also take every opportunity that you can. And if opportunity is not there at your door, build that door. You learn from our best instructors, books, and our classrooms. The College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Guam is more than just a program. It's a foundation of something greater. I think the professor that inspired me the most is Dr. Randall Johnson because he's really keen on what it is that we're able to do, our abilities, and push us towards being our best. And I think that's important for any professor. You come to college for quality education and what you take away is the experience. I'm pursuing a graduate degree now because I really enjoy doing research and a lot of that encouragement was from my professors. My name is Via DeFont. My name is Marisha Mariano. My name is Anthony Carino. My name is Rojan Javanel. And my name is Dr. with class. class. We help you write your story and it's up to you to finish the rest. Register today and begin writing your future. All right. Half a day, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this lovely Friday morning for the University of Guam College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences 43rd Annual Research Conference, otherwise known as the Class ARC. My name is Cassandra Santos. I'm a graduate student at the Division of English and Applied Linguistics, and I'll be joining you today um, as your master of virtual ceremonies. Now, before we begin, a couple of housekeeping notes for our virtual conference. To maintain the quality of the virtual event for all of our attendees, we ask that you please keep your mics muted during the conference presentations. If you have any questions for our presenters or thoughts you'd like to share throughout the conference, we encourage you to share them in the Zoom chat. Uh, and if you like, you may also share some reactions using the reaction button, totally fine. Um, there will also be some time after each presentation that's dedicated for questions and answers. Today's conference is being supported by the University of Guam's Global Learning and Engagement Team, otherwise known as UOG Glee. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties throughout the conference, please don't hesitate to contact uh, our, the Glee team directly in the Zoom chat or 
if you prefer a phone call, uh, you can call them at 671-735-2600. Or you can e also email them at uog.gle, that's G-L-E, at triton.uog.edu. We'll also be sharing uh, their contact information in the chat. As a reminder, today's conference presentations have been divided into three tracks with presentations going on simultaneously. During the breakout sessions, UOG Glee will be available in the main lobby of the event to assist you with moving to the breakout sessions you'd like to attend. You may also move to the breakout session of your choice on your own. And last, but certainly not least, we encourage you to join us during today's conference breaks to view selections from the ARC art exhibition and UOG class ARC host presentations. With that said, we'll now open the conference with an opening blessing performed by Inetnon Gefpago. to Inet Non Pago for that beautiful blessing. Um, once again, my name is Cassandra Santos and I'm your master of virtual ceremonies for today. Another very warm welcome to all of you today, no matter uh, where you're joining us from, whether locally here or maybe from stateside or within the region. Um, we appreciate you joining us for the 43rd annual class research conference and supporting both the conference and research in the region 
through your attendance today. Um, at this time, we would like to acknowledge the presence of the following dignitaries. Um, Dr. Anita Borja Enriquez, Senior Vice President and Provost of Academic and Student Affairs. Doc, uh, Ms. Deborah Leon Garo, Vice Provost of Institutional Effectiveness. Dr. Charlene Santos Bamba, Vice Pro Provost of Academic Excellence and Director of Graduate St Studies and Online Learning. And the Honorable Sabrina E. Perez, Senator for the 36th Guam Legislature. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, at this time, we now introduce our university president, Dr. Thomas Christ, to welcome you via video message. Buenas and half a day. Congratulations on the 43rd class research conference. I'm sorry that I can't be with you today to enjoy it, but I'm uh, very pleased to see the range of topics that are covered and really pleased to see this um, contribution to uh, research at the University of Guam. Uh, as you may know, our st current strategic plan, Parahulo, uh, really emphasizes recognizing the university as a research university centered in island wisdom. And so uh, the class research conference has been one of the central, most important ways that we've promoted uh, the research that's uh, conducted in the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences for a very long time. And I'm pleased to see so many different disciplines uh, becoming more and more engaged in research. And you may also know that uh, the University of Guam has really uh, catapulted up in the level of research funding that we've been getting. We're now getting 17 million a year in federal research funds from the National Science Foundation and from the National Institutes of Health. And so while we're the, one of the very smallest of the um, universities that receive such funds. We're in the top 35% of universities across the country in terms of the level of funding we're getting from those distinguished federal research uh, sources. And it's worth pointing out that the National Science Foundation funded the um, Indigenous Language uh, Program grant uh, that um, uh, which of course is in the in the humanities and so it's important to notice that a lot of the research funding in the National Science Foundation actually supports uh, work in the humanities and social sciences so um, it's great to see that happen uh, and, and I'm so pleased to see this research conference contributing to our reputation for research and also I think it's really important that we make sure that undergraduate research and collaborative research between students and faculty members is a really uh, important and growing part of our character as a university so that the, the, the research agenda, the research enterprise is enriching the student experience and, uh, and faculty work across the university. So congratulations. Uh, thanks to uh, everybody involved in setting this up and keeping it going. And thanks to congratulations and thanks to all the faculty and students who are presenting. And um, I'll close with Biba UOG. Viva eulogy. Uh, thank you, President Kreis. Uh, I now welcome Dr. Anita Borja Enriquez, our University Senior Vice President and Provost, for her remarks. Dr. Uh, for joining us as the Pagu. to the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences Dean, Associate Dean. Uh, and the uh, conference organizing committee members for the invitation to offer remarks this morning. Uh, this year's conference theme retrospectives, a look at origins and how these take us into the future offers an opportunity to reflect on origins um, in general. In other words, knowing when and how events, people and plans came to be is significant to moving forward in the journey ahead. This year, our university celebrates its 70th uh, year Platinum Jubilee as an institution of higher ed education. And we acknowledge its successes are attributed to people who have invested their careers in elevating and expanding our institution's reach across the region and globally. UOG Ford and the Parahula Strategic Plan are guided by some moral values held dear by many for generations. In Adahis and Inagofli'i, based on island wisdom that is mindful of respect, compassion, and community is a major complement to our value of Inafat Malik, fostering harmony in how we arrive at solutions. These tomorrow terms translate to looking out for each other and caring for one another. The meaning of these terms 
resonate with the people and culture that hosts our institution. In Adahi Zeninat Gofli'i, align with UOG's mission to enlighten, discover, and to serve with our strategic intent to transform lives and advance communities. The University of Guam exists and came into exist it, it came into existence to serve the needs of our island and our region. We exist, exist because of the communities we serve. Teaching, research, service, community outreach and engagement. These are all a part of our profession and purpose as an institution. We look out for our students, our colleagues and community partners and make decisions based on what's best for all. This annual research conference theme begs for us to pause, reflect, assess, evaluate, and consider how our actions and de decisions have impacted the region and global con contributions. There have been a lot of successes and there have also been missteps. These are expected. The question I now pose to you is this, what can we do to ensure we continue to provide value and opportunities to our students and communities and remain impactful in all that we do? In Adahi and in Agofli'i are tantamount to chartering, charting a course for new horizons because we must first consider our origin, who we serve, where we are, and what will lead us into the future. In closing, I'd like to leave you all with this. As we navigate through our future together to foster respect, compassion, and community in all that we do. Gi dinanya i espiritu gi inadahi sen respetu. Nihi te gopti, ta silebra i mendifrenshata, da ta chokwi motna para i didespatsan et mas gaibali, na minaulit gi komunidad siha en ay minastaga man masotsutsut sen ma huganga de hit. Together, in the spirit of inadahi and respect, let us celebrate our differences and work towards delivering the optimal value to the communities we live, work, and play in. I'm so excited, like all of you, about the incredible lineup of unique and valuable sessions today. Masi to our distinguished and diverse presenters for providing today's rich content. And congratulations to our class colleagues for another year of hosting this amazing conference and continuing to provide a space for sharing of knowledge and research. Biba class and Biba Yoji. Thank you, Dr. Enriquez. Um, our intern dean for the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, Dr. Mary Cruz will now share a few words. Thank you, Cassandra. Half a day and good morning to all our conference presenters and participants. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 43rd class annual research conference. This year's conference theme, Retrospectives, a look at origins and how these take us into the future, provides an opportunity for us all to think more deeply about our world and from how we got here to how we can shape where we are heading. This conference, as Dr. Enriquez noted, will showcase the strength and resilience of our university and our community as we celebrate our 70th Jubilee. Retrospection, however, is incomplete without a commitment to thinking deeply. With over 20 presentations across three tracks, we hope this conference will serve as a venue for you to dive into these depths. On behalf of the college, I want to give a special thanks first to our conference organizers led by Dr. David Ruskin. I'd also like to thank all of our presenters, moderators, and staff for your commitment to expanding scholarship in the region. And lastly, to our wonderful university community, especially the Global Learning and Engagement staff, ISLA Center for the Arts, and the Integrated Marketing Services team for your commitment to furthering research and community engagement at UOG. I hope you enjoy the conference and thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Um, lastly, we welcome this year's class ARC committee chair, Dr. David Ruskin. Dr. Ruskin. Excuse me. Welcome to the conference. 
So I, I know that people always say this is a momentous occasion, but this really feels like an especially momentous occasion because uh, aside from the 70th Jubilee year and class's 43rd year of doing this conference, it was two years ago that this conference was one of the last things that we did in person. It was like the next week that borders were shut down, the quarantines were set up, we were sheltering in place, there were roadblocks set up, you had to papers to go across the island, I don't know if you remember that, it was madness. Today, two years later, this seems to be, fingers crossed, this appears to be, let's not jinx it, one of the last things that we'll do virtually because of the pandemic. Things are opening back up, vaccines are reaching all corners of the globe, tourism is returning to Guam, Momentous, I suppose, maybe in the way that all things are momentous in their own way, but it feels like a notable anniversary and an auspice of brighter things ahead. We have a great handful of talks, posters, and artworks for you today. Uh, we have had some last minute cancellations and swaps. I just want to mention uh, Elaine Cortez, who was speaking about the pedagogical virtues of video games, was unable to make it today. Vanessa Duenas, speaking of the Chamorro diaspora, also unable to make it today. Danica Valerio and Maxim Williams will be speaking on the topic of misinformation and local politics, 2 p.m. track one, replacing Pono Christensen, uh, who was going to speak on gender relations, also on, uh, unfortunately un unable to make it today. That's it. Welcome to the conference. Biba UOG, Biba Mes Tsumoru. Thank you for those words, Dr. Ruskin. Um, at this time, we will begin transitioning to our presentations via Zoom breakout rooms. Now, you can move to the breakout room of your choice on your own, or if you'd like some help, uh, please free to con feel free to contact our UOG Glee team uh, via the Zoom chat. They're all in there ready to assist you, um, and just let them know what, which room you'd like to move into. Uh, UOG Glee will also remain in the main virtual conference area should you require further assistance. Once again, thank you all for joining us for the 43rd class ARC. I'll see you after these presentations for our keynote speaker, Ms. Rinrati Limtiako, president of the Pacific Daily News.
Uh, welcome back to the 43rd class annual research conference. I hope you were able to maybe get something to drink or munch on during the break. And I hope you enjoyed this morning's presentations. Um, now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Cruz, Interim Associate Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, who will introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Cruz. Good afternoon, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the morning session of presentations and the amazing posters showcased during the break. We are excited to welcome you back for our keynote address today. Our conference keynote speaker is Rindrati Celis Limtiaco. Ms. Limtiaco is president and executive editor of the Pacific Daily News. She became publisher in 2007, a journey that began as a reporter in 1991 working her way to executive editor with oversight of the newsroom. She has stewarded the transition of the company from its corporate ownership with Gannett to its local ownership in April of this year. Ms. Limtiaco started in journalism because of her love for writing. She stayed in journalism because she realized that good journalism can make a difference. She started her career covering politics, government, education, and every once in a while, the type of story that made you better for having read it. Eventually, she worked her way through the newsroom and became publisher. Over the years as publisher, Ms. Limtiaco has successfully navigated industry and economic challenges that she could not have imagined when she, be when she began as a reporter. The media industry today is very different from the media industry of 30 years ago, or even of five years ago. The industry has undergone significant disruptions since the internet made its mainstream debut in the mid 1990s and continued with the readership raised on the smartphone and social media. With her 30 years of experience in the island's media industry, Ms. Limtiaco's job has been to cover, direct coverage on or engage in the way the island has evolved and changed over the last few decades. What has stayed constant is her belief that each of us has a responsibility to make the community a better place in whatever capacity we can. As president of the Pacific Daily News, she is committed to supporting community organizations and efforts that focus on the island's economic and social development. Ms. Limtiaco was born and raised in Guam and is the eldest of six daughters. She thought at one time that she would have to go far, far away to make her mark. But then she realized home was, a, was, a good, was as good a place as any to accomplish her goals. She has been recognized for her work under Gannett in her roles as journalist and as publisher, including top three publisher of the year twice. In addition to her full-time role leading the island's daily newspaper and other publication, Ms. Limtiaco has been committed to civic and community organizations serving in board and officer capacity. Ms. Limtiaco has a Bachelor of Arts degree in journalism from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She is married to Stephen Limtiaco and has three sons. We are especially excited to welcome her this afternoon to give today's keynote address. Ms. Rindrati Celis Limtiaco. Thank you. I feel like that is the keynote. <laughs> like, uh, well, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to all of you uh, who are here today. And thank you so much to the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences for inviting me to be a part of such a wonderful conference. Okay, so let's start. So can one person make a difference? I often say that I majored in journalism while in school because I love to write, but that I stayed in journalism because I saw that I could make a difference. When I came home from college, I thought I'd do a couple of years on Guam, hang out with my family since I'd been gone for a while, and then I would go off to bigger and better things, bigger newspapers, become a foreign co correspondent, you know, whatever the future had in store. But there was something about doing news on Guam, here at home, near my family, that kept me here happily, I might add. Part of it had to do with the fact that the PDN was a Gannett newspaper and eventually there was enough corporate interaction that I could have the best of both worlds. 
part of it was I'd already had become invested in the work I was doing here and believed that there was still more to do. The theme of today's conference is retrospective, but I was also told that I could speak about anything I wanted to, so I decided to do both. I looked up several definitions of retrospective. Retrospective is a noun, an exhibit of some sort, looks at past work, and then retrospection, the art of processing or surveying the past. The definition fit with what I considered to be a retrospective, studying, let's say, an artist's work over the years, how their work has changed and why. Another definition, I'm sorry, another definition that popped up was retrospective law, which I will not pretend to understand. And then there's retrospectives in business, similar to what we call a postmortem in our office. It's when you take a deep breath to study a market launch or a project that you just completed, to assess what went right and what went wrong, and then identify adjustments that need to be made as you move forward. Now that definition sits a little better with me as there seems to be purpose behind the retrospective. That definition implies action. The standard definition implied a reflection. It's a noun. And in my business, it's the verbs that matter. I believe that the value of re reflection or retrospection comes when it can be parlayed into action. So what I'm offering today is a retrospective of something I know. I am taking you on a retrospection of my work. When I first came home after being away from college, longer than it should have taken for my mother, I entered the world of local journalism. That was 1991. I'd studied journalism and was excited about practicing journalism in a professional newsroom. While at university, I had worked for the student paper which was independent, and we were a very aggressive team of aspiring professional journalists. Often our goal was to beat the local newspapers in Honolulu on any significant news surrounding the university, and even a little bit beyond. As you can imagine, I was very used to directing news that did not always make the university happy. My first few days at the Pacific Daily News, I noticed something interesting. Many of the journalists weren't from Guam. They were hired from off island and expected to do two to three years here and then head back to the mainland. To be honest, this wasn't so different from other media or many established institutions on Guam. It wasn't different from what my father knew in the 70s when he was working at Botech as a high school instructor teaching small or heavy engine repair. Many of the instructors at that time and probably most of the administrators were recruited from off island. When I started my job at the PBN, I also remembered, I also remembered my parents setting up job interviews with me for Senate with senators who they said could pay me more. Believe me, at the time I started at, as a reporter, there weren't many jobs that could pay me less. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do journalism. I remember my first year covering the legislature. I sat in the executive director's office at least once a week for about an hour at a time. There was one time when he asked me why I wanted to be a reporter. He said the goals of a reporter seem to conflict with the values of our culture. I wouldn't accept that, but I could see where he was coming from. If it's a journalist's job to uncover truth and hold institutions accountable, then I can see how that might be viewed as counter to the values with which I was raised. The truth was fine, as long as it didn't embarrass anyone or make anyone feel uncomfortable. That sentiment was quietly woven into our cultural notion of respect. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but if the first step in fixing a problem is acknowledging that there is a problem, then that perspective can get in the way of growth. Let's be honest, when I don't even think I heard the word therapy ever in my childhood, that was just not how we did things here. But I would not believe that being a good journalist and being culturally sensitive were mutually exclusive. And if it hadn't been proven out, then I was going to do it. 
I could see how the harder stories would be easier covered by folks who are not from here. It's not always easy to ask tough questions and do the tough stories that upset sources when you might have to break bread with one of their families later, one of their family members later in the evening. Now, I don't think this was the motivating factor in how a newsroom hired at the time. I think we just didn't have many local young people aspiring to be journalists. But that perspective shared with me just made me determined to prove that I could be from Guam, raised on Guam, and still do a good job as a journalist. Asking the hard questions, being fair, and telling stories that mattered to our island. But I learned that my commitment had to go beyond my reporting on a story. In the news process, a reporter writes the story. We often talk about the length of the story measured in inches. The story then gets handed over to an editor. And then after the editor has worked on that story, it goes to the copy desk. Sometimes the story might be too long and copy editors would have the responsibility of trimming a story to fit in the space that it's allotted. This is the process for print. I remember writing a story that involved the late Senator Angel Santos. It was before he was a Senator. In the story, he was juxtaposed with a Navy Admiral. Now, I don't remember what the specific issue was, but it more than likely had to do with something involving Chamor rights, activism, and possibly a military base. I knew my story was too long. I knew it had to be trimmed. And for some reason, I felt that day that I had to be a part of that process. Now, let me be clear. I believe that everyone I worked with in the newsroom had the same beliefs I did around fair and balanced journalism. But it isn't always conscious, is it? How we view people and how our experiences have shaped our perspectives. Much of that is influenced by how you were raised, how you were conditioned, and the value system you've earned. In essence, where you've been or where life has taken you. I know that for many of my colleagues, there wasn't a very solid understanding of activism at the time. And many of them weren't raised here to understand how closely tied our community is to their cultural identities. Their stake in what happened here was not going to be as important to them as it was to me. Now that might be a generalization, but I think it was the truth for most of them. So for that story, I stood next to the copy chief, essentially the head editor for the copy desk, and watched them cut my story. I said to them, for every comment you cut from Angel, you take one from the Admiral. Whether I agreed with what Angel Santos was saying was not the point. The point was that we had to be fair. And fairness goes beyond the reporter doing the story. I learned that that day. It extends to how the stories are handled after it's handed off. Fairness also is in the stories we choose to do, as well as the ability to truly understand the importance of the issues, whether you agree with them or not. I was probably given coverage of Angel and Chamorro rights issues intentionally. I didn't have a problem with that. I would rather the reporter in the newsroom who understood these issues at the time be given the assignment of covering tomorrow issues. We had many conversations in the newsroom. At the very least, it woke people up a bit, if not solved the issue altogether. I think shortly after that happened, I consciously felt my responsibility to be a part of an important change. So I started the youth internship program at the PDN. The reality at the time was that all newsrooms were hiring from off island. It wasn't just the PBN. We just didn't have the local talent pool here. In fact, it's still a very tough industry to hire for locally. But I figured that if I wanted local journalists in our local newsrooms, I need to do something about it. So I did. Every year since 1992, we work with 12 to 17 high school students who apply and earn a year long internship with the newsroom. From that program, we had reporters and editors in the newsroom. The Washington Post now has three of our internship graduates. Here at UOG, you have one of our strongest interns who's now the director of your UOG press. That's right, former intern. <laughs> and the author of the Properties of Perpetual Light, 
also was one of our strongest interns and one of the best singers you've ever heard. We do not pretend to take all the credit for these young people's accomplishments, but the program was created, yes, to build journalists, or at least a love and understanding of journalism at a young age. But it also was created to give people, young people who love to write a way to learn to write and to be valued as writers. A couple of years ago, a couple of years after I started as a reporter, I was promoted to editor of the local news desk. The relevance of that was that I could make hiring decisions for the desk. We still didn't have a robust hiring pool of local journalists, but I figured if I could find local applicants who were motivated to be journalists and could write, even without a journalism background, I could teach. My team could teach. And that's when the concept of a teaching newsroom was born. I'd say it was a 50-50 enterprise. 50% 50 of the time, the effort paid off. The other 50% of the time, it did not. But if I wanted this, I knew we had to do things differently. What I wanted was a newsroom that reflected our community in every way. Local reporters, mainland reporters, as long as it was balanced. And not just reporters, but editors, copy editors, photographers, the whole newsroom. Part of, and with part of those efforts, I'd also encourage local journalists who worked on the mainland to come home. We scoured off-island colleges for their journalism grads. We kept in touch with our high school interns throughout their college careers to see if anyone wanted to come home to work at the paper. Often taking them on as summer college interns while they were here. By the time I finished my stint as local news editor, we had a newsroom that reflected our island. So why was this important? Well, news is important. People depended on the information to make the world go round. If we had a team that reflected our community, then the news and information that we provided would be news and information that the community needed and wanted. More importantly, the information would be conveyed in a manner that was sensitive to our community's identity and cultures. It was doing work from the ground and not in the ivory tower. I left the PDN for a couple of years to be a part of the launch of Laddie Magazine. When I'd left the paper, its first Tomorrow Managing Editor had left shortly after. After Laddie, I came back as business editor. It was in the business section where I noticed that many of our local business stories didn't have great local representation. The experts or professionals that we quoted for our stories were often not folks who were from here which was fine if there weren't local professionals on island. And to a certain extent in the mid nineties, many of the different industries did not have strong local representation, but it did exist. You just had to make the effort to find them. When I was at Laddie, I was working on a project that involved middle schools and how pivotal those years were, as well as the different issues that middle schoolers faced. One of the issues was racial division. We were interviewing a group of Chukis girls that day. One of the girls was really outspoken. She'd acknowledged that she felt that she was racially discriminated against. When I asked her why, she said that other students stereotyped Chukis students as children of alcoholics and criminals. She shared that her parents were teachers and she was very proud of them but it didn't seem to matter in how others saw her or her friends. Her comments really pushed a button for me that day. All I saw was our role in perpetuating that perspective. We have a responsibility to our readers to reflect them in our stories in all capacities and not just as folks who've been arrested. We have a responsibility to our children to show them the possibilities to which they can aspire. They need to see themselves in our financial experts, our doctors, our lawyers and teachers and other professionals who positively contribute to our community. This is a goal that needs to be met with intent. It's not just going to happen. We definitely are doing a much better job of this, but we're not quite where we need to be. It's something that we continue to be conscious about and strive to be better at every day. After the business section, I moved to lifestyle and projects. 
I probably had the most fun there as an editor. Although I love news, what we call hard news. I have a soft spot for the section where celebration is queen. We focused on stories that told our island stories. We featured foods that we know and love, the kind of food that you can pick up at a gas station or mom and pop stores. We sat around a table with moms, aunts, and daughters rolling lumpia, with them explaining the dish, yes, but also capturing the multi-generational language shared during those few hours. We shared the childhood hierarchy of rosaries, who could serve, who had to fold chairs, the long line of relatives that you had to meet or kiss afterward. Shortly after being editor of Lifestyle, I became edit executive editor of the newsroom in 1999 and sat in that role for about eight years before becoming publisher of the newspaper. I'd taken many lessons I had learned working in the newsroom and institution institutionalizing those lessons in the running of the company. I thought that what we had accomplished in the newsroom and in our stories were so tightly woven into our DNA that it could not be unraveled. About nine years into my tenure as publisher, our corporate owner, Gannett, which for most of my time at the paper had been very focused on allowing independence in their local newspapers, underwent a massive restructuring, primarily separating the newsroom from the business side of the operation. The news structure did not fit well here. The newsroom no longer reported to a local publisher. Instead, it reported to an editor in Phoenix. Decisions were made that focused heavily on cost efficiencies, a newsroom of 25 was reduced to 15 and then later to about 10. Design layout and copy editing of the paper moved to Phoenix. Deadline for the paper kept moving earlier. At one point, the newsroom deadline was 3.30 in the afternoon. Anything after that would not make it into the next day's paper. It was ridiculous. We received a lot of criticism for those changes. Readers felt that we didn't have a lot of local stories in the paper. There were atrocious headline errors that we did not write, but were written in Phoenix. Readers and advertisers shared their concerns that it seemed we cared less about the community. The thing is, is when you spend decades building community ownership of your media company, your readers and customers have expectations. When those expectations are not being met, then it is well within their rights to let you know. Now you have to remember PDN is not just a company or a newsroom. It's also a collection of people. Some of the staff in the newsroom have been with PDN for more than two decades. Jojo Santa Tomas, who many of you have read his columns on food and continue to read his sports coverage. Steve Lemtiaco, who happens to be my husband, has spent almost 30 years focused on what we call watchdog journalism. Dwayne George, been our opinion editor for decades, and they especially were frustrated. This structure, which exists in Gannett to this day, was demoralizing to the news team and throughout the company. And as a publisher, I had no control over these changes or this direction. When we used to have Christmas parties, I would have to do the opening remarks. I proudly explained that our company's mission is different from most companies in the community. <clears throat> Although we are a business, we have the added responsibility of protecting the First Amendment. And if we can't do that, if our resources are stretched to the point that we cannot fulfill that mission, then we have no business being in the news business. Part of that responsibility is providing news and information that means something to our community. If we've disconnected from our readership, then you might as well call it a day. The criticisms that came our way were deserved. I was frustrated myself. And if I'm being honest, I was sad. My work at the PDN was not just an investment in the company. It was an investment in strengthening media on Guam. I think when we're better, we make everyone better. It's just the nature of competition. Think about it. When I started, I was one of a few in the newsroom who was born and raised here. That picture is very different now in all the media on island. It's still hard to hire local journalists, but I see a much greater commitment to growing local journalists 
amongst all the media here. Well, last year, something that we never thought would happen, happened. A local businessman bought the Pacific Daily News. The net had been bought by Gatehouse Media in 2019. With that came more changes, as well as a willingness to sell some of its holdings. And the Pacific Daily News was one of those holdings. It was a year after the pandemic started when the paper was sold to Kaleo Moylan, and we hit the ground running from day one. It hasn't been an easy journey. Extricating our business systems from Gannett was a feat unto itself. And that was probably the hardest part of the transition. The transition that we put in place for news was a lot of work, but it was soul soothing work. For me, it was not an opportunity to unwind everything that had been done to the newsroom and by extension, our readers over the last five years. For our veteran journalists, it was Christmas. We could finally do the work that five years of disconnect had essentially taken away. We now have more local stories in our paper and on our site than any other media. We have a strong life, lifestyle section that focuses on storytelling and slices of life that are a part of our local fabric. We have a rejuvenated sports section that even in these times of COVID, we can hardly keep up with coverage. After almost a year, in fact, 21 days short of the year, we have a news product that truly reflects Guam. All the good things, and yes, some of the bad, but ultimately it is a true reflection of home. Now, why does all this matter? In my idealist heart, I believe that knowledge is power. I cannot sit back and lament apathy if I don't do something to combat it. My weapon of choice is knowledge. It's news and information that hopefully inspires someone to do something. I don't care if it's a column, an opinion piece, an investigative journalism story, or how to apply for financial aid. I want and need the information that we provide to be something that empowers this community. And our readership has changed. We are the first to acknowledge that our readers have changed in many ways. How could they not? The news of depleting newspaper circulation throughout the country is old news. The, inter the internet came along in the 90s and just kind of whooped life as we know it. Then the dang smartphone that all of you hold in your hands, pockets, purses changed the world. For many of you, you don't know a world without either. This is bound to change consumer behavior in the consumption of information. It's something that's been happening now for at least two decades. And if you haven't adjusted to that, it's kind of late. And in that consumption, readers also have changed regarding the type of news they want to consume and how they consume it. It is clarity in our vision that keeps us moving forward. I have clarity in who the Pacific Daily News is. I do not compete with the New York Times, nor the Washington Post, nor the Wall Street Journal. I am a community news company. I serve my island community. My responsible is to the people of our island and our region. My responsibility is to our pe the people of our island and our region. My product is going to have photos of your pets in costume, probably. I'm going to run the warnings from village mayors to keep your dogs leashed. I'm going to cover a school board meeting and a power rate increase meeting and legislative session. I am going to write a column about how we exist as a territorial clause subject to the whims of Congress. Because it doesn't matter what side of politics you sit on or which national news media outlet you believe or which you believe is full of fake news, even with national and international news, people on Guam always will care about what's happening on Guam. Not only, but always. And if there are national stories that have local repercussions, then I care about letting you know how those national stories affect your life. How people get that information is probably one of the most significant changes. But that's a change that we handle and execute on very well. The important thing is that we continue to connect and engage with our readers through information they care about. And if they care, then it's possible that someone somewhere We'll do something and make a difference. 
So I've spent almost 4,000 words walking you through a retrospective that is a study, I suppose, of my work. I don't pretend to any of, I don't pretend to think that any of this happened because I did it all alone. The evolution from my first few days in the newsroom would not have happened without the support of my managers and even corporate Gannett at the time. And the team that has helped drive all my crazy ideas, well, if they weren't along for the ride, this probably would not have gone so well. And if now is the time to take that deep breath after laying out 30 years of work and looking at how well this little project went, I have to say that many lessons were learned along the way, least of which was that if something is important enough to sustain, then you can't take your eye off the ball. And what if it does happen? What if things do unravel? What if the work you committed your life to starts to unravel? Then you don't give up. You just keep working it because the opportunity will come back and then you do everything in your power to make things right. And last but probably most important of all, you have to remember why you do what you do. You keep that in focus as you move forward. For me, my responsibility to my island, my team, and to the First Amendment keeps me focused. The love and support from my family keeps me going. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with me. And thank you, Ms. Lintiaco, for uh, sharing some of your time with us today. Um, that, was, that was a really moving uh, keynote speech. Um, at this time, we will now be sharing uh, some questions for our keynote speaker. If you have questions, please go ahead and sh share them in the chat. I'll be moderating them and sharing them. Um, I do have a question. I, I can go ahead and start if you're ready for it. Okay. Um, sure. <laughs> as you're looking back and reflecting on your extensive work in journalism, but also your relationship with our local community here, as you're looking back, um, have you been also looking forward, just kind of reflecting on where our past might lead, the, maybe the future of journalism in Guam? Do you have like any sort of a call to action you'd like to share with the next generation of journalists on island? I think um, call to action. There's been a lot of that in the last uh, 11 months and two weeks. The, the maintaining the focus, I guess, on, on the current readership and uh, the needs that the community has, you know, as long as that is the direction that we are moving in, that is the, how do I say it, that, you know, the, the, that is our goal and being positioned enough to change, you know, as, as the readership evolves is the type of consumption evolves, I think is, that's kind of our guiding light, right? So um, the need for good, strong local journalists on this island will always be there. Like I said, people always want to know what's going on in this community and how it impacts them and what they can do, you know, no matter what side of an issue you sit on. And I think it's the responsibility of our local journalists to make sure that our community is informed to make those types of decisions. So I, you know, I think our work in developing local journalists will continue, has to continue. Um, and, you know, I believe that importance is seen by all other media, you know, not just us. Thank you for the response. Um, Dr. Santos Bamba has a question. Um, sorry, hold on, let me scroll back up. Uh, she asked, can you please comment on your experiences with regard to the challenges of being a woman in the journalism industry, a woman and mm. a business person? Um, wow, okay. So when I was starting, that was not an issue. Like I never really thought about that. You know, I just figured you worked hard and you just kept going. Um, but I noticed even when I was in the corporate world, you know, we'd go to publisher meetings or editor meetings or um, even kind of even API sessions, which are like workshops for editors 
and things. Often I'd be one of like three women in a room of like 30 men. Um, and after a while, it was kind of like, man, this is the norm. I think there, there has it been a challenge for me. I don't think it has. I think that the few times where it might've come up, you know, I weathered that challenge well. I remember having someone from our corporation say, you know, about a really uncomfortable situation. So is this something you think you can handle? It's like, so you pay me to run a company, but you're not sure if I can handle this uncomfortable conversation. I'm like, what? Um, and, and my response was, you pay me to handle it. I'm going to handle it. You know, I, 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 I think the, where I've contributed on that point is um, the few times that I have the opportunity to engage in either talks or workshops or things like that with women who are aspiring to, you know, either start careers or go further in their careers is essentially, you know, um, hoping to empower them with whatever advice or guidance, you know, or mentorship that I can. And, uh, but it's, you know, the struggle is real. <laughs> um, speaking of advice, Dr. Ames has a question. Um, do you have any specific advice you'd give for students who are looking to get into journalism? Yeah, apply for Vibe. That's our high school internship program. And I will tell you the reason why this program is just like so wonderful is because we treat the kids, I'm sorry, we treat the interns as, as journalists. You know, they, the, the way the program works is there's a summer that's spent training them up on different uh, journalism skill sets. And then during the year, you know, as a cohort, I mean, they come up with story ideas, they're given deadlines, they have to write stories, their stories get published. They have to meet journalism standards too. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing that they can do. And I think it's a very, um, very good thing. Uh, the other thing I say is that a lot of the different schools have, if not school newspapers, school newsletters, things like that. And I applaud the advisors who take on that challenge because it's a lot of work. Um, and uh, kids should get involved in that. You know, the whole thing is just keep writing. I think, so when I first started college, I started as an aerospace engineering major. My thing was math and science, but um, I'd always loved to write through high school, you know, through college. I remember being the only engineer in a creative writing class. And I remember getting a lot of dirty looks because I think they figured that if you were in engineering, you couldn't really be a good, you know, you, you can be a good writer. Um, but I love to write and journalism was kind of an accidental stumble. I wanted to uh, switch majors and focus on writing. And the only real writing discipline in my school was journalism. And then when I started the program, I started working for the school paper and writing a story that really got the entire university campus reacting to and they didn't even know who I was because, you know, in print, you're just the byline. Um, that was like, I was hooked. So after that, it, it was like, wow, you know, if, if something that I did and put together could kind of generate this kind of reaction, you know, it, it was something that, that, uh, that I really wanted to do. So, you know, my advice is to the kids is, Look at our program. I think some of the other media also have internship programs, you know, weigh it out, uh, join one. And if not, just keep writing, write for your school paper, join your book, <laughs> whatever it is uh, that keeps you doing it. All right, I like that advice. Keep writing, keep going for it. Um, yeah. uh, Ms. Therese Howe is actually sharing some information about that, uh, the Vibe High School internship application in chat. It opens in late April to early May. And you can email vibe at guam.pdn.com with any questions you may have. Um, She's of, their advisor. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Always <laughs> <promote> <laughs> the program. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from the chat? Anyone else have anything they'd like to ask Ms. Lintiaka? Mm, okay. Um, if not, uh, 
thank you again, Ms. Lentiaco, for being our keynote speaker this year. I agree, you are an amazing and great role model, not just for journalism, but just as a community member of the community, that very strong relationship there. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, so before thank we're you. going to move on to our afternoon presentations, uh, we'll be taking a short break. It's gonna be about 30 minutes, I believe. Um, as a reminder, please join us for our poster presentations and our art exhibit pieces during the break. And we'll see you back here at two o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.
once again to the 43rd Annual Research Conference. Um, as a reminder, today's conference presentations have been divided into three tracks with presentations going on simultaneously before uh, once I roll through some of the reminders, we will be sharing the schedule on screen and you can select which track you'd like to join. If you haven't pre selected a track, um, you'll be able to select your track once the breakout rooms open. And if you require assistance moving into those breakout rooms, um, please feel free to reach out to the global learning and engagement team. They'll be here in chat, uh, so you can just go ahead and message what route track you'd like to join. Um, if you have any issues, they will remain in the main meeting room for the duration of the conference. Um, and as a reminder, of course, uh, as the presentations are going, start thinking of those questions for presenters in the chat, you know, interact with them, share your reactions to what they may be saying with the little emoji buttons. Um, yeah, that is pretty much all I have to share with you guys. Uh, I'm looking forward to there are remaining presentations for this afternoon. Thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy your afternoon sessions. <laughs>